Good afternoon, everybody. I'll call the meeting to order. Welcome to the uh, City Council's regular council meeting of December 18th, 2018. And uh, we will start with the uh, announcement of the roll. Ms. Gomez. Let the record show that all council members are present. Thank you very much. We had no closed session today, no study session. Uh, we do have a presentation today. And Andrea, are you, are you doing this? I'll sit right there, even though I'm not tall. I'm here today on behalf of Congressman Mike Thompson, who is working in another part of the district, but he wanted to honor Mayor Corsi as he finishes his term, term on the city council and as mayor. So I'm here to present with you a congressional resolution that's been read on the House floor and submitted to the National Archives. And I'll read just a, a small portion of it, um, where Mr. Corsi was elected to the Santa Rosa City Council, has served as vice mayor and mayor. During his tenure as mayor, Mr. Corsi oversaw the annexation of Roseland, the reunification of Old Courthouse Square, and has led our community in the immediate aftermath of the October 2, 2017 wildfires. Mr. Corsi has held many committee positions, um, as well as everything else, the partnership and policy. <laughs> there, you've done a lot. <laughs> uh, and he closes as Mr. Speaker, Mr. Corsi is an admirable leader who is dedicated to serving our community and is therefore fitting and proper that we honor him here today. So thank you for your service very much. Thank you very much. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Don't make me use this. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andrea. Right. And please uh, thank Congressman Thompson for me. I, I really appreciate this. And knowing that it was read on the floor of, of uh, the House of Representatives and, and the Capitol still stands, that's, that's good news. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to staff briefings. Is there a fire recovery briefing? Yes, there is a, a couple of presentations. Um, the first I'm gonna ask um, Jason Nutt and Eric McHenry to come down um, and um, talk council in the community through a new dashboard uh, where you're gonna be seeing a couple of these roll out. This one um, was with the assistance of our, of our consultants at EY um, to be able to do a better pr way for you, you as, as the council and the community at large to understand the uh, FEMA public assistance projects and process. Um, and I will turn it over to Mr. Nutt and Mr. McHenry. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Corsi, members of the council. Uh, Jason Nutt, Director of Transportation and Public Works uh, Eric, with Eric McHenry, uh, our IT Chief I Information Officer. Um, uh, Eric and team uh, working collaboration with uh, staff from Transportation and Public Works began to develop uh, uh, a, a, a dashboard for use by members of the public as well as members of staff. Um, they worked with Ernst & Young, who actually has the raw data, uh, in an effort to try to create something that was easy to use, easy to function and understand, um, as easy as you can as you navigate the public assistance process through FEMA. Um, we've been working on this program for uh, about the last three months, trying to come up with a methodology to describe how we, the city, are working through uh, getting all of our public facilities back up and operational following the wildfire. Um, so I'm gonna take you and I'm gonna run you through fairly quickly the, the elements that we have incorporated here. Um, as you can see in the upper left corner, we do have a total. That is, that is the current total estimate that the city has. Um, this has been a, do a dollar amount that's been fluctuating over the course of time relating to the amount of damage currently being uh, identified as directly related to the fire. If you recall, last spring we used a number of about $111 million. 
through the course of time, some of those projects have shifted out of uh, out of the. Um, uh, out of the system uh, and are no longer being incorporated. So the 54 million is the current range of uh, total estimated damage uh, within the city of Santa Rosa. And if I could give a brief example, at that point, remember, we were considering a, a one of the big projects was a $40 million total system replacement of the Fountain Grove area. Uh, a water and that project through very, very tough and deliberative work was was narrowed down to an $8 million uh, project. So that's an example of, of why probably these things haven't existed before. Uh, I, I have, have said to our friends at the National Institute of Standards, this is actually would help, would help communities see the process more clearly and be able to track this over a period of time and actually start to answer question because things do change as you go through the analysis phase. Uh, you'll also see on here a number of tabs, tabs calling A through Z, A through G with a Z on the end. Um, there's a brief description on a pullout that talks about what that is. This is standard FEMA process. This is the way that they categorize different levels of damage. Uh, category A would be debris, category G would be parks, category Z are administration costs. And so there's a pullout on the left-hand side that gives some very basic information about the nature of the uh, phraseology that occurs uh, on this. Um, moving forward, if you look at uh, the 54 million here in the upper left, that's the total. If we were to choose a different category, so category C, our estimated amount is $8.2 million of damage within that category. Uh, and that category, as you'll see there, is identified as roads and bridges and all things associated with roads and bridges. Um, as we've looked uh, toward the middle, we have kind of an indicator uh, that shows not only the total amount of estimated damage, um, but it gives some information about where FEMA's at in the process. And it says at this point, FEMA has obligated uh, or authorized $29.4 million of damage uh, and, and our ability to begin working on recovery for that. Um, the meter immediately adjacent to that talks about our ability to spend the money. So right now, at, at this point in time, we've invested $4.6 million. And when I say invested, that's stuff that's already worked its way through the system. Uh, as the city manager mentioned, um, we've completed uh, the water quality program up in the Fountain Grove area that had about an $8 million cost. This number will begin to increase as we, be, as we start populating uh, the, the database in the background that shows which projects have been completed. So you've got the tracker that says how much FEMA has indicated they're willing to spend, uh, and then you've got the tracker of how much project and money we've spent in an effort to come back to uh, a completed community or a recovered community. Um, in the lower left, it is, uh, it goes into more detail about what our estimates are. So it breaks out the categories and shows how that $54 million is distributed uh, among the different categories. Um, if we then click on uh, a, um, a category, it then gives a little bit more detail. And that detail will talk about uh, what FEMA's current approved cost is. It'll talk about pro component of the discussion with FEMA that's unresolved. So that would be the current remaining amount. It's an unresolved discussion. FEMA hasn't concluded on that. Um, then you'll have uh, a component in there that talks about the approved for funding, which is their actual obligation amount. So the obligation amount and the uh, approved costs may be slightly different depending upon the specific project type. And so that's why we've got two different categories there. Um, one of, if, if if you take your uh, um, the pointer and you highlight over it, some of these, uh, as you can see, exceed the top of the image, and you can't see the amount on the top. But if you roll, scroll over it, it will give you the amount. Um, if you have issues understanding what the uh, description 
of that category is or that particular bar, um, we've created a, a definition of terms tabs that will give you in the most concise, uh, publicly dispensable way uh, to describe the FEMA process. Um, it's not an easy thing to describe in layman's terms, but we've given it our best shot. Um, this may shift and adjust over the course of time as we hear feedback from individuals saying, I just don't get it, or gosh, that really made sense and I understand it completely. Um, so along on this right side, uh, there's a number of different things. It will give you a different aspect of the FEMA funding status. Um, as I mentioned, in the, uh, as we see in the tracker up above, FEMA's approved $29.4 million. Um, in all categories, we have about 14.7 that's currently being uh, uh, discussed. That doesn't mean it's been denied. It means that we're not at a place where FEMA is ready to obligate those funds, nor have they necessarily agreed to our cost estimates that we've presented. Um, so we're still in the process. You'll see there is a um, there is a piece that will talk about um, about projects under appeal. Uh, four of our projects are under current appeal from FEMA, meaning uh, they've denied them and we have since submitted an appeal request saying we don't understand why you've denied us. We think we were justified and so we've been going through that. So you'll see there's about $4.7 million of that 54 million that's under current appeal. Um, some of the 14.7 that you'll see that's, uh, uh, that's not currently decided may ultimately end up in that uh, appealed or denied section as well as we continue to work with FEMA through that portion. So we've done our best to try to take what we think the largest components and most uh, interesting components of this process are so that the general public can start to see what we're doing to try to recover the public infrastructure. Um, and so we've just taken a couple of different, uh, some of the different tabs just show the information in different ways. So if you look at each of the categories and where we're still trying to figure out how to navigate some of those, um, you know, we've got quite a bit in our uh, category F, which is our utility section that we're still trying to get FEMA to clarify, to approve, and to move forward with. Um, we may have spent funds that aren't currently obligated at this point. Uh, so for example, the water quality component, part of this, part of this $4.8 million in this uh, image is work that's already been completed um, that we had to in order to get residents back into their homes uh, in a safe way so that we could lift the water quality advisory. Um, but we're still waiting for FEMA to obligate those funds so that we can request reimbursement. Um, so this is uh, a methodology that we're using to try to provide more information. Um, you can go one step further if there's a specific project that you're interested in seeing. Um, in the upper right corner, this links to our CIP database. You can click on one of the red dots and it will talk about which project it is that's listed in our capital improvement system. It will discuss um, what uh, project type it is. It'll talk about which uh, phase of the project it's in uh, and what we think the estimated dates of completion will be and it will give some basic information. So we've done our best to give folks not just information about the broader component of recovery, but then also being able to look at individual project level information. So that's where we're at. Like I said, I thought Eric's team did a fantastic job of integrating comments from a number of different sources, data that's been collected over the course of time in various spreadsheets. Uh, Ernst and Young did a fantastic job of helping us collate all that data. Uh, and um, Jamie Smedes, who's our marketing outreach coordinator, tried to make it look presentable to the public. So it was really quite a team effort, really pleased with uh, how this ended up. And with that, I can ask, I can answer any questions or hope to answer any questions you might have about this. And before we turn it over to questions, um, this, as I said, is the first of, in several dashboards we're gonna be rolling out. Uh, a subsequent dashboard will be talking about the amount of at staff hours that have been spent and we will continue to track those on the recovery process um, and on mutual aid going forward. Uh, you're gonna be entertaining a, a, an item later tonight 
tonight um, that is um, about extending our services for the final time with Ernst & Young, the consulting team. After they leave the city, um, those, those responsibilities fall back to staff. And as you see, these projects are far from completed. Uh, there are going to be a, a huge amount of time and energy spent by staff in, in, in managing this. As, as we said early on, this isn't a one or two year process. This is five, eight, 10 years in the process. And one of the things I found interesting is that this ha work hadn't been done before. And I think one of the reasons why is that this snapshot in time is going to change. It fluctuates. It fluctuates based on, as you heard, damage estimates, project scope, revision of project scope, negotiation with FEMA, um, I'm not sure um, uh, our, our partners at FEMA are, would be 100% happy about this presentation, but that's where we are. Um, we need to bring some more clarity to what's under discussion. I just was related uh, a story that um, from Councilmember Schwedhelm about a presentation in um, uh, in Coffee Coffee Park with Coffee Strong that referenced um, some difficulties we may have been having early on in the process around uh, bringing Coffee Park back online, um, but things have progressed since there. Um, this team has spent an incredible amount of time actually making the turf eligible. Um, because uh, 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 tr uh, um, traditionally things like lawns are not eligible. We spent a long time arguing that this was an engineered system that was irrigated underground. It wasn't just simply grass planted. So those are the types of unfolding conversations that staff has been wrestling with. This is our first attempt, and this may be one of the initial attempts to dashboard this process for our community. So we're expecting to learn as folks uh, play around in this space. But I wanted to make sure it's clear that that this won't be the last dashboard you will see. I got to see a prototype of the one that is about staff hours invested in the recovery process. And I think it's gonna be a pretty astonishing thing for the public to understand the amount of time and energy that's being spent on making sure this community recovers. Uh, the last piece, if I could, I'll just, uh, this site will live on the recovery website where you see these three tabs uh, on the recovery website. There will be a fourth tab added as the public assistance tracker. And so just wanted to make sure that you were aware that this will live in a place that's, that will be easy, easily accessible by the public. Thank you, Mr. Nutt. And I wanna um, appreciate Mr. McHenry and your team also. This is a tremendous amount of information in one place. Um, that I think will really be helpful for all of us to understand this process as we go through the next few years. Uh, Jason, do I understand this is not uh, publicly viewable on the site now? Right now it is not. Um, we, uh, we took it down, we, we, we started with a draft because we wanted our partners at Ernst & Young to be able to view it. Uh, we've since taken it down now that they've had a chance to see and work through that piece um, so that we could build it. Uh, there was information that was conflicting, there was language in there that might not necessarily have been easily understandable and relatable. Um, some of the words that we use internally between us and our consultants um, as Mr. McGlynn said might not be acceptable language in front of FEMA, uh, and we want to. And so we've spent quite a bit of time. And it sounds silly, but but what we've learned with FEMA and Cal OES is semantics are very important. And if you say something even, or you note something that's slightly off of what they would expect, uh, it can become a fairly substantial issue. Uh, and and so one of the things, for example, that you'll see here uh, is uh, an appeal that we're working for on our road maintenance or our road repair relating to the debris mission. Um, when we early on started discussing how the damage was occurring, because the tools that we use are related to life and longevity of a roadway, when we try to describe the damage, we were using terms based on life and longevity. FEMA doesn't like those words. Not only do they not like those words, the minute you say it, they latch onto it and never get rid of it. Uh, even though it may no longer be relevant, it is truly damage. So 
we wanted to be very careful before we sent this live that, that words that we knew were going to be sparks uh, were taken out of the mix. And, and since we'll be on break for a period of time, we do want to roll this out as soon as possible so they will be public, but we wanted to make sure that we had this moment to show council that we're working on it and that this is going to be rolling out so it wouldn't be surprised over the next week or so when we do roll it out. I think the... To, to, and just in, in, in FEMA's defense, FEMA does not pay for loss of useful life. It is explicit in their, um, in their regulations. They play for damages. And again, this is sort of the learning experience, but also the challenges you face, the vocabulary you use, and you're familiar with, may not be eligible and thus creates issues for you. And that's why we do have to work through these processes together with our partners. Ms. Combs. Thank you. And thank you very much for this. It's really helpful. It's helpful that it, it will be up and easy to access when the time comes. Um, it's, it's useful, particularly if we can keep it in the context of other things that we're doing uh, moving forward. So I, I look forward to referring back to this. Because I look forward to looking back to it, and I suspect other people will also, you have clearly explained where it is. Is it possible to also put the link in the city council agenda online so that when we look at the agenda and look at the notes, the minutes online for this meeting, it's easy to find that way also? Uh, yeah, we'll work with the clerk to make that happen. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, one of the substantive conversations we've been having at the Open Government Task Force uh, revamp, trying to get the Sunshine Ordinance across the finish line, is obviously accessibility for our Spanish-speaking community as well. Is any of this website able to translate effectively into Spanish? I, at this point, I would say no. I would say we're not even um, translating fully into English, but we, we know that that, that, is, that is something we're going to need to work on. Okay. Uh, we are continuing that conversation, uh, and I don't know where we'll end up on it on the Open Government uh, Task Force, but uh, I'll put in my own little plug that uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see that coming forward as a uh, suggestion slash requirement from, from that body. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions, Council? Thank you very much. Mr. McGlynn, does that Thank you. Uh, conclude the staff briefing? No, um, we, we already had um, very successfully rolled out a, another dashboard um, that was working through the rebuild process. And I just want to give uh, direct, uh, uh, Assistant City Manager Guin an opportunity to uh, highlight the progress that's been made to date on the, through the resilient city permitting and rebuild process. Great, thank you. And uh, just a re refresher, as Jason mentioned, there'll be more, a new tab here. Uh, we did talk about some of these before, again, the maps that show you can drill down to the parcel level, determine what's happening on every parcel, and then on the far side, custom reports that individuals can pull to generate reports on their property. And these are things we are extrapolating citywide, and so you're gonna start to see these rolled out, roll out citywide for all building and construction tracking of, of activity around citywide. So it's something that has been um, increasingly gaining traction. Uh, the tracker, which which I'm going to talk about right now and just give a quick update on. It's very similar to what, what you just saw, um, but this is tracking uh, rebuild progress. Uh, right now on the top left corner, we track where permits are in the process. So once a permit's in the review process in room six, uh, when it's done and it's ready to be issued and ready to start construction, a lot of times it's held here until the contractor is ready to pull the permit and uh, when they have the materials and labor ready to go. Um, this is under construction, so as of today, there's 915 under construction actively out there. And this is updated about every hour, so it's, it's live data and you can see this change on a, a fairly regular basis throughout the day. Um, and then we have 93 uh, complete. We anticipate by the end of the week, we'll, we will have hit uh, 1,500 homes in this process and 100 homes complete by the end of the week. Um, so that does get us about halfway through the re rebuild process. Uh, what that does mean is there's another 1,500 that have not started this process or submitted a permit and we'll be working uh, to identify what those issues are, some of the barriers and uh, what those issues are over the next couple months. 
Uh, the other thing this does in the bottom corner is tracks a, a few metrics on some of the policies that the council put in place in the resilient city ordinance immediately after the fire. One of those was temporary housing. The, the council put in a, a temporary ordinance to allow temporary housing for five years. So far we've issued 54 permits. Uh, so people are able to put a trailer on a, a slot or to live in a location um, while their home is being rebuilt. Uh, so that number is uh, live and changes on a fairly regular basis. And the other interesting one is the ADU policy. So the ADU policy the council put in place is part of the resilient ordinance. Um, this is just the rebuild. So as people are rebuilding, people are adding ADUs. So this is new housing stock that we didn't have prior to the fire. So there's 40 new units that were added over this past year that we didn't have before. Um, so th those policies did make a difference. Uh, the, the fees did make a difference. And to put it in perspective, the rest of the city this year, we saw an additional 40. So we're up to 80 this year um, citywide in terms of um, ADUs added to the system, which typically we see 10 to 20. So uh, again, those policies were were very effective. Uh, so this, this dashboard is available, and it's, uh, um, it's available to the public anytime, um, where we just showed you under srcity.org slash rebuild, uh, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions, Council? Mr. Schwedham. Thanks for that update, David. Can you share with me, I, I know in uh, Coffee Park area, we see some of the FEMA trailers on some of the lots, which I would assume are some of the 1,500 lots. How is that, uh, what is, what's the city's role as we get close to the end of the five years? Um, what's gonna happen with those? Did, did you mention FEMA trailers or personal trailers? Well, so, so my assumption is they're the, the FEMA trailers. So the FEMA trailers are primarily at the fairgrounds. Those are where those are located. What you see on personal property are typically personal um, trailers that are located there temporarily during a rebuild. Uh, we, I believe, I have to go back and check our notes. I think there was only a, a one or two that were FEMA trailers that were located on people's individual properties. So at the end of that term, uh, the FEMA runs out in 18 months. So that's a conversation we're gonna have to have over the next few uh, months. But uh, individuals at the end of five years, hopefully their home is rebuilt and they can find another location for that, or uh, we have to find a way to, to move them into a different um, situation. I, I guess my interest would be we have we start that conversation for some of those where you see the trailer, and if they have not engaged the city in the rebuild right. process, I'd hate to see five years, and now it's like right. we're, we're stuck to engage that conversation to see what we can do to help them with that rebuild effort. I guess yeah. it'd be my interest. Thank you, and I think, as mentioned before, we have about 1,500 in the situation that have not started this, so so part of that is to identify who's living on the lot in a temporary location, who's sold their lot, um, who is still have insurance issues, other other issues about why they aren't rebuilding, and, and, and try to come up with some solutions for that, um, because you're right, there's gonna be, over the next few years, it's gonna go fairly quickly, and to be prepared for that is gonna be a key. Yeah. Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Gewen. Does that conclude that item, Mr. McGlynn? That concludes that item. I have a card from Peter Cherniff. To Mayor Chris Corsi, sincerely, good luck. And regarding this topic, I just had a few questions I was thinking out loud, and I thought since I'm here, I'll just share them out loud. You know, they, uh, they mentioned uh, the Sunshine Ordinance, and, you know, they talk about that all the time in San Francisco at the soups down there, and I think, what does that mean, Sunshine Ordinance? That means are we acknowledging that we're not using the Constitution as opposed to pretending, and that we're gonna have all these other things try and fit in there for little pieces of, of, of helpfulness. It's the Constitution that needs and will be the law of the land soon enough. And so uh, then the topic about FEMA, I was listening, I couldn't quite get all of it, but it says something about they have monetary concerns regarding property loss, things to do with money, but not people. And I found that interesting. Um, I mean, paradise, 50,000 missing people, were they incinerated or were they sent to FEMA camps uh, by the military? Uh, that'd be a good question. So I'll finish off with that one by saying anybody can look up or I would suggest you look up the Matrix of Perception, Revolution Radio, and listen to the latest uh, discussion about Paradise by Dave Wilcox. That's Matrix of Perception. You won't be bored. Thank you. Moving on to city manager, uh, is there any report from the city manager? Yes. 
Uh, the Office of Community Engagement is pleased to share that three grants totaling $30,000 have been secured for the 2019 launch of, of, the, of their Neighborhood Fest pilot program. The United Way is of Wine Country, the Healthcare Foundation of Northern Sonoma County, and the Community Foundation will contribute $10,000 each towards the pilot program designed to build community connectedness and social cohesion strengthened by asset mapping for community preparedness. The pilot program will include eight Santa Rosa neighborhoods, Aston South Park, Burbank Gardens, Junior College, Moreland Ridgeway, Shorewood Forest, Sunset Avenue in Roseland, and West End neighborhoods. Staff is working on plans for additional events in partnership with Burbank Housing and Catholic Charities. Um, the temporary fire station five is scheduled to open on Friday, December 21st at 3480 Parker Hill Road. Firefighters began moving in equipment last week. The temporary fire station was constructed following the October 2017 firestorm when fire station five was destroyed on Newgate Court during the Tubbs fire. The Park Hill Road site was the former location of fire station five before closing in 2015 when the station relocated to Newgate Court. The vacant Parker Hill Road station was also destroyed in the Tubbs fire. Station five firefighters and the station engine have been temporarily housed at, station, at fire station one since October 2017. The city broke ground on the temporary fire, fire station project in July of this year. Um, the city of Santa Rosa continues to work on a plan for rebuilding a permanent fire station, including the exploration of potential new site opportunities that will better meet the needs of the community planning and economic development. Santa Rosa was selected by the Council of Infill Builders to receive the 2018 Community Infill Champion Award for leadership above and beyond in rebuilding and building a vibrant and resilient city. The city was acknowledged for the work it has done over the past year to put in po in place policies and processes to support the rebuild and for the work it's done aggressively putting in policies, fee structures and processes to support downtown infill housing. And finally, um, the finance department is proud to announce that Ken Nadeau won the statewide California Parking Professionals Association Award for Parking Professional of the Year. Congratulations to Kim. Thank you, Mr. McGlynn. Um, all, all pieces of good news, and particularly the community engagement grants, that, that'll be a, a, a really good addition to, to that effort. Any questions uh, from the council on this? Ms. Gallagher, do you have a city attorney's report? Um, I do not have anything to report this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, council, any statements of abstention tonight? Okay. Mayors and council members' reports. Anyone down here? Mr. Olivares. Thank you, Mayor. I do want to report that on Saturday, uh, Vice, I'm not Vice Mayor, I think he used to be a Vice Mayor. Uh, Council Member Sawyer and I attended the uh, Emerald Cup. Uh, very, very well attended event. Uh, if I understand, they have a contract for five years with the fairgrounds for that event. Uh, so I'm hoping maybe after the first of the year, we can reach out to them and see how the city can uh, work with them. I, I suspect there's a, quite a bit of an economic uh, impact to Sonoma County and Santa Rosa. So it's, uh, I think it's something that we need to look at in the coming year. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. I was there with, with the council member Olivares and I was absolutely taken aback by the popularity, the numbers of people, the, the, the calm nature of the event, the, um, and then I know there are, there are stereotypical reasons why that may occur um, given, given the nature of, of the event, but indeed it was, um, it was special to see the fairgrounds um, sold out. I mean, we, I was standing there with one of the organizers and he got a phone call on his cell phone and he said the event sold out. And this was at 1.30 in the afternoon which meant that no one else could could be in, could could allow would be allowed entry into the fairgrounds because of the sold out nature of the event, and I think that speaks to the popularity, economic development in the city of Santa Rosa. I'm I'm looking forward to hear, hearing about um, public safety issues. Uh, I haven't heard any report yet, any kind of um, anything in, either in the newspaper during um, or after, and so I'm looking forward to getting a final report from from 
the powers that be as, as far as uh, in increased numbers of calls for service, but it was um, quite an impressive uh, uh, event and very well run. And I was just, it was, it was pretty impressive. I just, I can't, I can't speak enough about the um, the impact on this community that has probably yet to be seen uh, as as far as the numbers of people. And uh, so I just, it was, I was pleased to be able to experience it firsthand, and it was very impressive. Thank you, Mr. Swedhelm. Thank you, thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, a couple different things. Uh, about a week and a half ago, we had the Joint Operations and Policy Team for the Santa Rosa Violence Prevention Partnership. And we do this on an annual basis, but this year we chose to have the nine um, providers who received Measure of Choice Grant Awards. Um, we actually learned a little bit more, just re-emphasize what each of the programs did, but then they had a participant of the program share with the um, group what impact uh, those Measure of dollars had with them. So it just reaffirms the great work that's being done in the community. Um, a lot of it behind the scenes, but it was, um, uh, Jason, um, I almost said Jason Nutt. Uh, sorry, Jason, I know you're not part of the uh, partnership, but Jason Carter did a great job about bringing everyone together. It really was an inspirational um, morning. Then we also had the Groundwater Sustainability Agency board meeting, uh, and we did a fee study public meeting, and so that will be coming back to this board with some of the suggestions. Um, there was some discussion about uh, what the, the other agencies wanted to contribute towards the efforts that we'd already started. I had already received direction from this body, so we stayed true to that. Uh, but the additional information will be coming in the uh, coming months regarding the GSA funding. And then uh, this last weekend, we did have the Coffee Park Information Meeting hosted by Recreation and Parks at Finley Center. I do appreciate um, Mr. McGlynn, the Recreation and Parks staff, because it was a well-run meeting. And it's, in, it's gonna be interesting to see the way uh, the final um, parts to the park end up uh, because we don't have all the funding now, but there's a lot of different interests and it is a community neighborhood park. So just having that dialogue and ongoing dialogue was uh, very helpful and staff did a great job managing the event. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Combs. Thank you, Mayor. Um, CASA uh, continues, that's the committee to house the Bay Area. Uh, it's the regional nine county uh, committee, basically a part of the ABAG MTC complex, um, created a final compact. The technical advisory committee uh, passed the compact with only one no vote um, for a large technical advisory committee. That's quite remarkable considering the 10 elements involved uh, crossing all mm -hmm. sectors. And uh, the steering committee uh, moved the item, moved the full compact of 10 items also forward um, with no solid no votes. A uh, couple of, the, we vote on a one to five point scale with one being the highest and five being absolutely not. And uh, there were no fives at the, uh, at the uh, steering committee level. Uh, it's going to MTC for review and to the full ABAG board for review and then uh, moving on to the legislature for uh, action for most of the items. Uh, I think I can proudly speak of our city as already having done easily six or seven of the 10 items in the compact. Uh, I appreciate, we, we are in fact cited in the documents as a model uh, to, look for, to look at, and I think we have a lot to be proud of with that. Um, I would like to give a longer and more detailed report on that, but I think this meeting is not that meeting. Um, so I will provide more information on that in January. Um, I'd also like, as is appropriate for our council report outs, to uh, talk about a motion. Um, we had made a specific motion uh, regarding reviewing the uh, Community Homeless Assistance Program and the Bennett Valley Senior Center Shelter and it had gone through all of the steps, but continues to not appear on the agenda despite having gone through all, all of the steps. My understanding is that the reason it doesn't get agendized is because we failed in making that motion to set a date. Uh, so I would like to uh, ask that we amend that motion so that we have a date if staff is able to provide this by January that we do this by the end of January. Um, we need to have that as a council discussion. We've been waiting a number of months. I think we started the conversation about this in August. 
Um, so I'm looking for a second for. Second. Um, thank you. Um, I'd also um, like to note that uh, the discussion as it shows on the list doesn't show the safe havens or bridge housing or um, uh, limited temporary encampments piece. And I wanted to be clear that I viewed the motion as it was originally made as including that. So what I'm doing now is just asking that we set the deadline and I appreciate the second. My understanding is that's all I needed at this step. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Rogers. And if I could, Mr. Mayor, uh, we've heard a, a little bit about the compact from CASA. You've been giving us updates. At what point would it be appropriate for us to have a study session to get more information about what's actually in it? Because I, I appreciate the updates, but it's yeah. not really a substantive conversation it's, that allows us to. I, and I think we do need to schedule having a, a study session or a report item so that we can send a letter about the items, uh, send our opinion in about the items. I have done that separately as a representative, but I think we need to do it as an entity um, because we will be working with our, the signing ceremony is mid-January. So I don't know if you would want to take it on prior to or post the signing ceremony. So if I can just make sure I'm clear on some of the, the timeline. So this week, is it MTC that is? Wednesday. Wednesday. As in and tomorrow. Then, and then mid-January is when it's signed and sent to the legislature? That's correct. But I suspect the legislature has their hands on it already. Mm -hmm. So it would be good if we could move a, uh, move a study session on the item. And I think we could ask uh, someone from MTC to, or ABAG staff to come and handle that. Well, and let me ask uh, Mr. City Manager, as a, as a practical, uh, this is our last meeting in December. Is, is there an opportunity for us to discuss what's in the compact before it goes to the legislature? So there's no staff capacity. I mean, I'm happy to go to MTC and asking them about some availability in January, but at this point, I mean, I, I will say that January 8th and January 15th are really, really heavy meetings already. I'll have to really look to see if there's an ability to schedule additional time on those two meetings. But I'm happy to ask MTC a question regarding uh, their, their availability to do a presentation in those first two meetings. But I just wanna make it clear that those meetings are already, They're already really long. heavy booked and in a conversation, including I believe some study sessions on those dates. But I, I, will, I, will, I will ask MTC. Okay, Thank and, you. and perhaps at, at a minimum, um, I know you've sent some information, but perhaps we can get a little bit I'm, more. I would be delighted to send the whole compact package to everyone. Yeah, and, and uh, I, But I think that just reading it doesn't get you where you need to go with it. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Vice Mayor, you have a report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And that actually, that dovetails perfectly. In our last uh, mayors and council members legislative meeting, we did get a very brief overview of the, the 10 items from uh, council member McKenzie down in Roner Park, who's been involved in it as well. Uh, and that was um, really the, the best opportunity that we've had to ask questions and, and get some information and thought that this body would benefit from having that conversation as well to see what's in it. Uh, outside of that, we did have our uh, next open government task force meeting. Uh, we have a red line, I've got to check with Sue that I think is ready to go on uh, certain sections of the draft ordinance that we'll put out there in the public for people to comment on as well. Um, I'll follow up with you after the meeting on that. Uh, and then uh, we did have our long-term finance policy and uh, audit subcommittee meeting last week where the subcommittee did move forward on an iteration of a revamped local preference policy that this council has discussed a number of times and so it will be coming back to the dais sometime in the new year for discussion and further action from us. <coughs> I, I apologize, Combs. I've just realized that it's not on our list for today, but I would like to congratulate uh, Tom Schwedhelm for being elected chair of the joint COC uh, that which occurred uh, recently and uh, it, I noticed he politely did not mention it, so I am doing so. COC being continuum of care and the new leadership group on homeless issues for the county and cities. Thank you for, for uh, letting us know that. 
Moving on to approval of minutes. Uh, we have minutes from November 27th and December 4th. Um, any abstentions, corrections, additions to those? We'll show those uh, um, approved as submitted. Moving on to consent, Mr. McGlynn. Yes, 12.1, Re resolution, approval of the second amendment to professional services agreement number F001625 with Ernst and Young. Item 12.2, resolution, amendment to the measure O, violence prevention implementation plan for police. Item 12.3, Resolution approval of agreement with Motorola Solutions Incorporated to purchase and install a dispatch console system and, appro and appropriation of $390,282 from Measure O Fund Police and $200,000 from State Asset Forfeiture Fund. Item 12.4, resolution approval of the First Amendment to Professional Services Agreement number F001748 with HROD Incorporated DBA MMO Partners. Item 12.5, resolution Santa Rosa Tourism Business Improvement Area Advisory Board Appointment. Item 12.6, resolution approval for purchase order 158133 street light poles and accessories. Item 12.7, resolution extension of proclamation of local homeless emergency. Item 12.8, resolution extension of proclamation of existence of local emergency due to fires. Thank you. Any questions on these items, Council? Mr. Schwedhelm. Thank you, Mayor. I just had a question on the uh, Ernst and Young, I think it's 12.1. Some of the items that are addressed here haven't come to Council. Is, are most of these projects for city staff and then you filter and eventually will be making it to us? Yes. Okay, and then one of the present, um, one of the items there said if these mitigation projects are approved by Cal OES and FEMA, the city could potentially receive approximately 63 million in Fed funding. Would that be on the dashboard? How much re reimbursement from the federal government for Ernst & Young so be on that the, dashboard? So that dashboard was PA projects, not mitigation. That's gonna be one of those future dashboards, but okay. yes. But that, yes. I, I don't wanna lose sight of that uh, and see how much we actually do get back. So Absolutely. I appreciate that, thank you. Other questions, Council? Mr. Cherniff. Thank you, I, uh, I got three items. Do I get three minutes each or three for the whole thing? You get three for the whole thing. Okay, all right. For uh, regarding Measure O, imagine it, see it, name it, and claim it. Uh, let's have law enforcement uh, read the China study where it's a most extensive study verifying that a lot of violences and cancers come from the animal flesh industry along with Will Tuttle's peace diet and uh, the Essenes Rabbi, Dr. Gabriel Cousins. So, and to the relief of law enforcement, the deliverance of justice unto former untouchables from on high is already on its way, so that's a good thing too, along with the 40-day prophecy strike. A lot of people were talking about the Andy Lopez case and I reminded a friend of mine, I was at the supervisors and the people, the place was packed and I was up there speaking about Andy Lopez and I said, he represented this and he represented that, but to me he was an angel. And I turned around, everybody raised their hands, they thought it was just great. And I said, well now that we all agree, then understand why he was an angel and what that means. And what that means, he was there to show us something. He was here to show us the indigenous connections uh, between Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, why they were vegans, why Charlie Brown, the Peanuts gang were vegans, but the fact that the U.S. Constitution was also from an indigenous source, the Iroquois, and that court cases against, you know, to make money off this, it's like you're charging a, a situation with an angel, it's like suing PG&E for the iron rod of God burning down the state of California, it makes no sense. Regarding tourism, 
it'd be wonderful to see uh, uh, the connections being made between the vegan peanuts gang to the plant wizard, Luther Burbank, to all the organizations uh, with uh, veggies and fruits and medicinal green and the permaculture and the beautiful heirloom gardens and how the city council helped uh, get the homeless people into teepees that became gardeners because we ended up doing hundreds and hundreds of gardens based off the 14 acre South Los Angeles urban gardens. And all these things turned out to be very wonderful results. And, and, uh, and, uh, and of course, you know, then law enforcement could walk through the gardens and someone actually toss them an apple like they did a long time ago. It's all a very positive thing. Um, and so, let's see there. Because up until now, it seems like there was a conspiracy to maintain the homeless population. Now, after all, why hasn't the, the very loud mouth, never achieving anything ACLU, ever taken the religions to task for false advertising? You know, do unto others. But let's work with the gardens because that's the positive way. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trina. Victoria Yanez. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm a member of Homeless Action Exclamation Point, and I'm very disappointed that we're suffering this winter with people straggling in the street. I'm sure you've seen them. People that have to take off their shoes because they're too wet, and take off their clothes because they're too wet, and throw away their blankets because they're too wet. If they find an eave to camp under or to put their tent under to protect them from the rain, the police will come by and move them and throw away their property. And now, if nothing's going to be done for people, basically, nothing's going to reach the streets from all this money that has reached us or from any collaboration the city and the county can do together to override whatever processes are becoming too slow to save some lives. Now, this has been an emergency for a long time, and I would like the police department to start acting like it. We cannot have the police throwing away people's personal property. I don't know why they're getting away with it. But I get a lot of reports of this. And I do want to see the day when the police themselves will be giving out sleeping bags rather than throwing them away, or giving out tents rather than throwing them away. What kind of a society are we? I saw a girl the other day, and, and I'm out there. I see people. I know most of the people, I think, at least the ones that are on the street. And there was this girl who looked like her nose had frostbite, I swear. Anyway, I wanted to read the article that Kathleen Finnegan put in the Press Democrat because I thought she said it all very succinctly, but I'm not that well versed in my phone to be able to call it up. But I want everybody to remember her words that we should be Sonoma strong, not Sonoma shamed. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Moving on, uh, no, I'm sorry. Mr. Rogers, you have uh, this item. I will move items 12.1 through 12.8 and waive for the reading of the text. Second. Your votes. And the consent items are passed unanimously. It is five o'clock, time for public comment on non-agenda matters. We'll start with Peter Cherniff. I'm gonna make a little announcement before I read what I have for this, and that is regarding the, the very good woman that just spoke a few minutes ago, Victoria, and, and she's heard me talk before about the fact that, you know, when it's been given, as you do unto the least of me, it was always about the animals, so we need to be taking care of the animals. We need to stop this abuse. And you know, there's lonely people in wealthy homes. 
right here in the sound of my voice. Lonely people in wealthy homes, as lonely and psychologically beaten down as, as, the, as a person soaked on the street. So it's time for these lonely people in these wealthy homes, I'm going to do this twice, write down the number of Victoria, the woman I just got done speaking to. Get your pen, get your pencil, write it down. Her number is 541-8357. And you're going to offer up your help and your services to assist with the homeless, if you can, and with the animal rights, as you will. And TPs, are, I think, is a great idea. So let the Committee on the Homeless Action Brothers and Sisters connect with the medicinal growers, organic heirloom gardeners, and vets programs to put something together so that the city council can be enthusiastic about helping you out with what's available. All right, that being said. Between now and this full moon, the universal physician and the mystical musician plays to the high noon, spiritual expositions, angelic requisitions, and celestial exhibitions. Unseen warriors, dog soldiers, arisen now to engage all workers of iniquities, all corruptions upon the sunlit stage. How many incinerated in paradise and why? For if you knew that would be, that which would be true, it just might make you cry. California been taken upon a ferocious ride. Truly, truly, there's nowhere to run, there's nowhere to hide. All for refusing to arise being royal, refusing to cease the slaughterhouse and the industry of oil. These two industries of bloodletting maintaining every war, foreign and domestic. Be there even time to repent or remove our, to remove our economic consent to still arise majestic? Knowing more be unseen than seen. Nothing be hidden through the emerald fire so green. Embracing the most beautiful action ever now be. Love's truest uprising, the 40-day freedom strike prophecy. For the time of judgment be at hand. Be there time for redemption? If there be time to start, pour forth through your heart, through the kingdom in your heart, all your strength and love, and ask you be supported from beyond and above. For the king of kings need not return, for he's never left. Always been here, I'm stating quite clear, in service to the queen. The goddess, goddess now arisen, busting every chain of this old prison. I say it, you hear it, you'll see it, it is done. Adrian Lobby should be followed by Bruce Pearson. For me. Arise, arise. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. My name is Adrian Lobby. I'm with Homeless Action. Uh, this week, we sent you a proposal for an additional uh, option for winter shelter in the city of Santa Rosa. And some of you may be wondering, why do we need more winter shelter? Isn't the armory open? Well, that is a wonderful option, and a lot of people are making use of it, thank goodness. But it is not 24 hours, and it does not have privacy for people to sleep. There are people with disabilities who require privacy for sleeping. And there are people who have more property than they're able to transport in and out every day. So we're asking for your help to provide 70 people with a secure winter shelter between now and April 30th. Every night, the police, your police, go out in Santa Rosa and move people out of their little hidey holes, the places that they're able to stay somewhat warm, somewhat dry. They make them pick up their belongings and move out into the rain. It happens over and over and over again. And it is not okay. I think anyone who is listening to this, if you take just half a second and think how that would feel, think what that would do to your health and well being, you would know that this should not be happening here in Santa Rosa. So I ask you to consider this 
seriously. We've got a lot of experience now. We've got a lot of help from the people in Seattle and from other places who are giving us models for how to do this well. We want to do a model that will be a beacon, not just for homeless people, but for all the people who want to help them to see that this is something that can actually work. I would also like you to um, encourage those, your representatives on the Leadership Council of the Continuum of Care to look at a wide variety of diverse projects for the HEAP funding. That funding is intended for emergency, for homeless emergency projects, and it should really go there. It's a lot of money. We can spread it around to a lot of little projects. You'll be getting a lot of proposals, those of you who are on the Leadership Council, where $100,000 can make a huge difference. So I would ask that you keep your minds open, think about it as an emergency, and uh, let's see what we can do to really make a difference in the next year. Thank you. Thank you. Bruce Pearson, followed by Gregory Fearon. Oh, this is um, David Bruce Pearson, uh, self-appointed spokesman for Homeless Action, um, speaking reading the words of uh, one of our members to you all. Please instruct your staff to accelerate their efforts to make public parcels available for homeless housing. This by authorizing immediate discussions with nonprofit organization representatives seeking low or no cost leases to include in program designs in HEAP applications due to the Leadership Council in February. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gregory Ferron, followed by Christopher Sprague. Gregory Farron, Homeless Action, I can't improve much on what Adrian and Bruce just said, except to remind all of us that we're entering into a period where a home in a barn on straw was celebrated and we revere it. It was a generous offer that we hold up as a model, and I think we can at least reach that point with our homeless. We've got a lot of energy and a lot of talent and I hope we take advantage of it. Thank you. Christopher Sprague, followed by Catherine Jurek. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm not good at public speaking, so I'm just going to keep my face down and read what I see here. But my name is Chris Sprague. I'm a 40-year-old resident of Lake County. I, as many of most of us know, we have had a fire crisis here in California, which has hit Lake, Sonoma, Napa, Mendocino, Butte, Mall of California. I've never witnessed nor experienced this new normal or no end fire season. <clears throat> oh, sorry, is this better? Okay. Um, I built and uh, patented a fire suppressor that goes on utility poles. Um, what it does is it affects it from catching fire, falling, creating a dangerous system for, for a problem for the community. Um, it protects from incoming fires and when starting at the transformer in case of a blowout. Right now I'm patent protected. I own the IP on it. And basically I'm just trying to get it out there to the powers that be to let it know that it does exist to the community. It does exist. And uh, I just want to get it out there and hopefully someone get to me, excuse my voice, um, and hopefully get on the pole and save some lives. And that's it. Thank you. Catherine Jurek, followed by Elizabeth Nealon. I didn't know what to put on my sign today because it seems like nothing gets heard. I'm hopeful. I'm still hopeful. I'm hopeful that there won't be people sleeping outside in the rain real soon. And this is a blank slate too. This could be thought of as, let me take a moment here and get my thoughts together. Let me think about what it's like outside right now. Which one of my family members do I want living outside? Which one of my enemies do I want living outside?
how far am I willing to go to step up to the plate and make sure no one is living outside. You've heard a lot of my friends talk about money coming in to our county and our city. Let's use that money for the emergency situation it's expected to be used for. Try some ideas, plan things, step forward and do the right thing like Bob Aronson did in front of you. He couldn't morally not say the right words of the atrocity that's going on in regards to human rights right here in our city and our county where we have enough money to take care of every human being with dignity. Everyone in this audience, if you're not doing something to protect the rights and dignity of every human being, you need some time to think too. If you go home and sleep comfortable and don't look in the eyes of people who don't have a home or comfort, you need to think, because we're all humans. We live together. I taught kindergarten. In kindergarten, all kinds of little kids, and they all get to have their own way of being and of living, and they all get embraced. That's the job of a kindergarten teacher. I think the city council has the same job of the people who live in our county and our city. Thank you. Elizabeth Dillon. Oh my God, this thing is way too high. Let me push it down. Oh, heavens, heavens, heavens. Well, I'm here to represent the raging grannies of Sonoma County and my good friend Anita is gonna stand here with me and we might even sing together, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes, of course. Here's a song for you guys. There's a cycle, there's a cycle, there's a cycle of abuse. Guns and beatings, harsh mistreatings, there's a cycle of abuse. How to break it, that's the question for all people far and near. So everyone on the planet can walk safely without fear. We as grannies take the challenge and with thought we do reflect on a world full of awareness and of mutual respect. Now all people have a mission in this universal scheme to enlist all of our children to embrace this global dream. Ah, 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 ah. Yeah, 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 cycle of abuse. <laughs> I guess we've all been exposed to it throughout our lives, especially if you watch television. But um, the, the, the cycle of abuse involves a honeymoon phase and some of the people live in that all the time. But there's also the te tension building phase and then there's the actual episodes. That's what the cycle of abuse is like. There's tension, there's a violent episode. And then there's a little honeymoon period. But then again, sometimes the honeymoon period goes away and there's just tension and episodes. Tension and episodes. You wanna say anything, honey? Okay. Your taxes are due today in the good old USA for guns and planes and bombs galore, the real cash crops that pay, but it's not for schools or jobs or health, it's, it's not the government's way. Let's hear it for the things we need in the good old USA. 
I think we're done. Uh, there is this other little ditty. Money, power, living like royalty. What a gold mine dealing in weaponry. Missiles and guided systems. It's Sorry, ladies, so but the tape has run, run out on that one. Moving on to our public hearing tonight. Mr. McGlynn. Item 15.1, public hearing, one time, 12 month tentative map extension. Amy Nicholson presenting, or, or you? Okay. Good evening, uh, Council. I um, just wanted to, Jessica Jones, Planning and Economic Development, just wanted to give a brief introduction before Amy gives her presentation. Um, as all of you will recall, in April of this year, in support of the city's residential development um, goals and policies, the council added chapter 20-16, which is the resilient city development measures to the zoning code, um, quickly followed by in May, adding several subsections to that um, chapter, reducing review authority for um, residential uses, lodging and childcare. Um, um, this chapter was created in an effort to be part of the puzzle of um, putting together uh, ways to address the city's various housing needs just over the, the general residential crisis that we have here in the city, but also following the fires. Um, so in the spirit of that ordinance, um, what's before you is looking at some subdivisions that are approved in the city and, and our effort to work towards um, allowing those subdivisions to move forward um, to address the council's housing goals. So now I'm gonna have Amy uh, give the presentation. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Corsi, members of the council. The item before you is a zoning code text amendment to chapter 2016 of the city zoning code entitled Resilient City Development Measures. This ordinance would allow for a one-time automatic 12-month extension for approved tentative maps and associated entitlements. This automatic extension would substitute for one uh, existing extension allowed under the city code. And so currently the subdivision code allows for five one-year discretionary extensions and this automatic extension would uh, account for one of those five extensions. This text amendment has uh, been formulated to help address the housing needs citywide following the fires of October 2017 and to assist due to both the shortage of labor materials and also professional services being experienced in the region. As you know, in June of 2017, the council uh, adopted its priorities, including the implementation of a comprehensive housing strategy to address unmet housing needs. In October of 2017, the Tubbs and Nuns fires damaged or destroyed approximately 3,000 residential units and 100 commercial structures. In December of 2017, the council held a study session regarding what eventually became the Resilient City Development Measures Ordinance. And in April and May of this year, the council adopted the Resilient City Development Measures Ordinance in two parts. Uh, in November of this year, the Planning Commission recommended approval of the proposed zoning code text amendment before you this evening. Just to go into a little bit more detail of what the ordinance proposes, although it is pretty straightforward. Uh, tentative subdivision maps, vesting tentative subdivision maps, and tentative parcel maps that were either approved or conditionally approved as of October 9th, 2017, would be automatically extended by one year. And this uh, extension would also be applicable to any of the discretionary land use approvals associated with those maps, and that might include a hillside development permit or a conditional use permit for a small lot subdivision. 
And I do have a correction. There are some numbers up on the screen that show that this ordinance would impact 36 subdivisions. Um, a few made it on the list that were actually approved after October 9th, 2017. And so this ordinance would affect 32 subdivisions and a total of 964 units. And up on the screen here is a graphic of the city. The pink triangles denote locations of the subdivision maps uh, that would be affected by this ordinance. The zoning code text amendment was noticed in the Press Democrat and by email to the Community Advisory Board and was posted at City Hall. Adoption of this proposed ordinance is exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act pursuant to the two sections shown on the screen uh, known as the common sense exemption and also consistency with a general plan and zoning ordinance. With that, the Planning Commission and the Planning and Economic Development Department recommend that the council introduce an ordinance amending city code chapter 2016, resilient city development measures to add a one-time automatic 12-month extension for tentative maps and associated entitlements to address housing needs within the city following the Tubbs and Nuns fires. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Nicholson. Questions, council? Ms. Gomes. Thank you, thank you for bringing this forward. Uh, it may in fact be very needed, so thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions though. Um, can you tell us what the exact vote of the Planning Commission was? It was recommended uh, unanimously for so approval. All of the commissioners were present and all voted yes? Yes. Thank you. Is the idea behind automatic that the individuals who need the 12 month extension don't need to request it? That is correct. They would not need to request it. Um, they could receive a letter from staff that outlines the new expiration date of the map, um, but staff wouldn't go through the normal referral and review process um, and they wouldn't pay the fees um, or submit the plans. I guess I'm asking is, it, maybe I didn't understand the answer. It, are they, do they have to say they want an extension at any point, whether or not there's, even if we have no fees associated with their telling us that? No, they do not have to request it. Okay, so my concern, I, I'm happy with this. I, I don't want to say no to this. My concern about ever doing this again is, it's real important that we not tie up land that people might want to put housing on. And so I would, it sounds like that would make this a yes. But if someone's holding land and they have it tied up because they have the map extension and someone else is interested in doing something with that property, this delays them a year. So I'm real concerned to know, it seems to me appropriate to give a, a kind of automatic extension to people who want it, but if the person is not planning on moving their map pro project forward, why would we give them an automatic extension if they're not planning to move it forward? Do you, you understand what I'm asking about? Yeah. Okay. Um, the one thing to note is that it would not preclude um, a, a new application coming forward, even if there was an approved project um, on that site. If somebody wanted to come forward with a new map or a different type of project, they could do so. Okay. I, I just think we should at least say, do you want it before we give it? <laughs> just seems make makes sense to me. Um, thank you. Other questions? And just, I want to make sure I understand this um, completely. Uh, when you have an approved subdivision, you uh, can extend the time on that by one year, five times or four times. This basically um, stops the clock from October 9th of, of 17 for the first year. What it does is it, 
it takes the place of a discretionary one-year extension that an applicant would typically submit an application for, and then the Planning Commission acts on that, that extension request. Um, so currently, any map that would benefit from this is somewhere in the the planning and economic developments process of it's undergoing review or it's currently valid. And so this, this extension would, would just automatically apply to any of those maps that were valid, um, whether or not, I think the logistics will probably be determined in our department on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on if they recently submitted an application um, or if they're due for another application since they were all approved at different times. Okay, so it wouldn't have to be for the first year. Correct. Thank you. This is a public hearing. I'll open the public hearing. I don't have any cards. Uh, does anybody want to speak to this item? Seeing no one rise, I'll close the public hearing. Bring it back to the council. Um, Mr. Schwedhelm. Yes, I would move an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa amending Title 20 of the Santa Rosa City Code, adding Section 20-16.120, one-time automatic 12-month extension for tentative maps and associated entitlements to address housing needs within the city following the Tubbs and Nuns fire of October 2017. File number REZ18-012 and wait for the reading of the text. Second. Council, your votes. That passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Nicholson and Ms. Jones. Item 16 is a written communication for your information. And we'll move on to item 17, Mr. McGlynn. Item 17, council reorganization. Daisy Gomez, city clerk. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Um, tonight we are uh, declaring the results for the general municipal election for November 6. The November 6, 2018 general municipal election was held pursuant to the City Santa Rosa Charter Section 30 and also the State Elections Code. Um, Sonoma County Registrar of Voters has canvassed the results of the election and has certified the results. Following the completion of the canvas of votes and before installing uh, the new officers, the City Council must adopt a resolution declaring election results for Council Districts 2, 4, 6, Measures N and O. So it's recommended that the Council, by resolution, adopt the results of the General Municipal Election of three specific things. One, electing each for a full term of four years, John Sawyer for District 2, Victoria Fleming for District 4, and Tom Schwedhelm for District 6 of the City Council. Excuse me. Declaring that Measure N related a housing bond did not pass with two-thirds majority vote and declaring that Measure O related to sales tax did pass with the majority vote and I'm here to answer any questions. Any questions, Council? I have no cards on this. Mr. Oliveris, do you have a motion? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, with pleasure, I move a res resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa reciting the fact that the general municipal election held on Tuesday, November 6, 2018, declaring the results and such other matters as provided by law and wait for the reading of the text. Second. And your votes. That passes unanimously. Um, at this point, uh, is uh, council member comments on, on the election? And I'd, 
I'd just like to start off by congratulating uh, Council Member Sawyer, Council Member Schwedhelm on your reelection, and uh, also to uh, almost Council Member uh, Fleming, uh, who will be taking a seat up here shortly. Uh, other comments, Council? Ms. Combs. Thank you, Mayor. And yes, congratulations are in order to the continuing and to the new council members, but I would like to make a, a statement to you, Chris, um, as mayor. Um, leadership is not just accomplishing what you set out to do, but also how you respond in an unexpected crisis. And I am grateful, Chris, that you were our mayor when the tragedy struck our city. Your deep roots in our community allowed all of us to benefit from your broad experience, both during and after the fires. As a columnist, you have um, been used to listening and also asking the right questions of the right people at the right time. And then you are also so skilled at articulating what so many of our community members have been feeling. You did this as mayor, and I thank you, Chris. You had a broader vision of how Santa Rosa could move forward with a leadership style that brought people together. You helped to create the climate of civility that we have had on this city council for the last several years. While we haven't always agreed on every policy item, the seven of us have been able to work together more smoothly and that is no small feat, and it is because of you. You helped us cross the finish line on a number of large, long-term projects, including the reunification of Courthouse Square, the annexation of Roseland, and something I personally campaigned for in the past, the neighborhood-based district elections. None of these achievements were a foregone conclusion, and you led our city and our staff patiently and steadily to bring them to conclusion, completion. Because of the fires, your burden has been heavier than most, most mayors. You have carried it with grace and dignity. You have earned a skiing break. And I thank you again for your service. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Mr. Schwedhelm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I also want to uh, applaud your efforts in our uh, journey together, being with uh, Council Member Sawyer, the class of 2014. Um, you know, we had a friendship prior to you with uh, Press Democrat and me with the police department. But um, starting in 2014, as we started to go to more and more events together and then working the last four years together, very uh, collaborative and again is um, very evident. We don't always agree on everything, but we treat each other with respect. And um, I really value your friendship and the content of what you've brought to the city. And I really think that those diverse opinions that you, we see up here uh, from the seven of us and the fact that you're a big part of that, um, you've really helped me become a better council person. So I really appreciate the efforts and your leadership specifically during the last two years of your mayorhood. Job well done. Thank you, Tom. Mr. Rogers. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, when I first ran and took office, I think one of the best pieces of advice that anybody gave me was that the issues that you run on are not likely to be the issues that you're asked to lead on. And I think over the last two years, we've seen that time and time again here in Santa Rosa. Some of them have remained uh, from four years ago when you ran. There was no way to prepare somebody to stand up and lead in the worst of times that we saw. And I can't thank you enough uh, as, a, as a council member for giving us a direction that we could follow for, as a Santa Rosan, for being there in the back room, fighting with FEMA, fighting with the legislature. I know that's not all visible, and I know that the public doesn't always get to see how exhausting those fights can be. Uh, so I just wanted to say thank you both as a, a council member and as somebody who lives in this community. Uh, we needed a statesman, not a politician, and that's what we ended up getting here in Santa Rosa, and I think that our community is better for having had you serve, so thank you. Thanks, Chris. Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It'll be different not referring to you as Mr. Mayor anymore. 
Um, but I just wanted to you thank... You can keep calling me that. It's okay. <laughs> you know, maybe I will, just to keep the tradition going. But I wanted to uh, give a personal thanks, um, because when I was elected, uh, along with Councilmember Rogers two years ago, and I had the chance to kind of serve under you as vice mayor, uh, you were incredibly gracious in extending yourself to me and showing me the process of how things worked here at City Hall. Um, and that was something that I remember, reflect, now that I reflect back upon it, thinking, you know, he didn't have to do that. God knows you were plenty busy sitting in that chair and being out in the community doing your duties as mayor. But I just want to extend a personal thank you for that. And I will always look up to you and appreciate you for that. And I also wanted to say I have appreciated your thoughtfulness on this council a lot. You know, when I was elected, I, I felt like thoughtfulness is the thing that you have to embody to the best of your ability. And, uh, but nobody has done that, in my opinion, better than you. Um, I would seldom ever know which way you were gonna go on any given issue. And sometimes, actually frequently, you'd probably sur surprise a lot of us. But that's only a testament, I think, to the amount of thought and deliberation you put into the consequences of every decision. And uh, I will miss that on the council. And I hope that we can all continue that tradition. Thank you, Jack. Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, first of all, I want to acknowledge, first of all, thank you. Uh, and, and also acknowledge the accomplishment of becoming not only a council member and a vice mayor and then mayor in one term. I'm not sure how that often that has happened. It may be completely uh, unique on this council. A lot has been accomplished. And you were literally, during part of that time, and a fair no amount of that time, literally under fire. And we, as a, as a body, have accomplished a lot, and it is, in the last couple of years, has been under your tutelage and your, and your um, leadership and your um, tempo and uh, your spirit that we have, have accomplished a great deal of that. And I, so many great words have been said this evening, and I just wanna say thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Mr. Olivares. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I think even in the best of times, uh, being mayor is often very challenging. Uh, and you had a hell of a time in your four years. Uh, thank you for your leadership. I know it was, uh, there were some difficult times with our disasters and all the other little things that come along our way. Uh, I think it is true that we set on, a, on this course at the beginning of four years or two years, even during your term. Uh, we think we're going in a certain direction. We think what's going to happen next, but then suddenly something comes along and changes everything, turns everything upside down for us, and we have to deal with it. Uh, you have dealt with it. You've dealt with a lot. Uh, you've dealt with the reunification of the square, uh, a disaster. We celebrated our birthday as well. Uh, there's so many other things that happened that I can't remember, but I know this. I know that you're going to write a book, and I can't wait to read it because I know uh, that is something. I know th that this was an amazing experience for you, uh, and I do hope that you put uh, pen to paper and do uh, document uh, your time here in the city council because I think it will be read by many in the future. So thank you for your service. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. And. Um, before I get to public comment, I just want to say a couple things. Uh, you know, the job of mayor over the past 14 months uh, through the disaster and, and into our recovery has been characterized as a, as a burden that I've had to carry. And I've never seen it as that, and I've never felt it as that. Uh, it's been an opportunity to do meaningful work at a meaningful time and I have um, felt lucky to be able to be the mayor of the city that I love and that I adopted as my hometown a long time ago. Um, I feel lucky in a lot of ways. I, I feel lucky to have, have come on the council at a time when um, folks were, were ready, they had an appetite for change on the council. Um, with staff, um, there have been a lot of changes uh, at, with staff during this period. Um, and we've, we've been able to make some big strides and make some um, big changes in this community, the way the, the organization operates. And uh, it's been a, a, a very beneficial time for me and the community at the same time, I think. I could spend a half an hour talking about um, all this stuff, but I won't because I know I'll forget 
someone or something as I do that. But I do want to make sure I thank my colleagues on the council, uh, the tremendous staff that works for the city of Santa Rosa, uh, from the executive staff to uh, the people on the line who are doing hard work every day for the residents of this community. Um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the work that, that people do for this city. And um, lastly, I wanna um, thank my family and my friends for supporting me over this time. I wanna thank my girlfriend, Gail Rappel, uh, for uh, sharing me with this job for the last four years. And I wanna thank the community for giving me this opportunity. Uh, public comment, we'll start with Ann Seeley, followed by Peter Rumble. Always classy. Is Ann here? There she is. Yes. Mayor Corsi. From my heart and from Concerned Citizens for Santa Rosa, I want to thank you for four years of hard work and caring. The flowers I brought for you today are of two colors. Yellow is for the sunny disposition that you have brought to this council that I appreciate so much. And the orange is for the passion with which you've faced the, the problems in Santa Rosa and done the very best anyone could do. Just as I worked very hard for your election four years ago, I hope that with any new endeavors that you consider taking part in, you'll consider asking me to participate also. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Peter Rumble. Uh, good evening, Council. Peter Rumble from the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber. I wanted to, uh, I'll be brief, and just say uh, words of congratulations to uh, the elected council members, uh, Tom, John, and Victoria. Congratulations. Um, I look forward to working with all of you uh, in the coming year uh, for sure. And I wanted to take the opportunity uh, to uh, thank and recognize you, Mr. Mayor, uh, for all of your work, both from uh, the perspective of uh, working as uh, colleagues uh, from the government side and, and going through the disaster, but also um, uh, beginning to build uh, better relationships and uh, partnerships. Uh, and I really thank you uh, for your uh, approach to the job. Uh, thank you for you know voting your conscience and and working on behalf of the community and not uh, not anything else. And uh, I really appreciate you and I'll and I'll miss you. Thank you, Peter. We'll move on to item 17.3, the administration of the oath. Somebody thinks thank there's you. another. Thank you. Is there another card? I'm going to count, ask uh, one council member at a time to come up and uh, take the oath, and then I will present you with the certificate of election. Uh, council member Sawyer for District 2.
Oops. Council Member Victoria Fleming, if I could ask you to come down, please. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Victoria Fleming. I, Victoria Fleming. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support. That I will support. And defend. And defend. The Constitution. The Constitution. Of the United States. Of the United States. And the Constitution. And the Constitution. Of the State of California. Of the State of California. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. That I will bear. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. True faith and allegiance to the Constitution. To the Constitution of the United States. Of the United States. And the Constitution. And the Constitution of the State of California. Of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. That I will. That I will. Well and faithfully. Well and faithfully. Discharge the duties. Discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter. About which I'm upon to enter. Thank you for raising your right hand. Um, repeat after me. I please state your name. I, Tom Schwedholm. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support. That I will support. And defend. And defend. The Constitution. The Constitution. Of the United States. Of the United States. And the Constitution. And the Constitution. Of the State of California. Of the State of California. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. That I will bear. That I will bear. True faith and allegiance. True faith and allegiance. To the Constitution. To the Constitution. Of the United States. Of the United States. And the Constitution. And the Constitution. Of the State of California. Of the State of California. That I take this obligation. Freely, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion or purpose of evasion that I will that I will well and faithfully well and faithfully discharge the duties discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter upon which I'm about to enter Mr. Mayor. So we will move on now to item 17.5, excuse me, comments by the newly elected council member, 17.4. Council member Fleming. No comment. <laughs> Yet. Yes. <laughs> but we are certainly looking forward to working with you. So congratulations and welcome. Uh, items 17.5 and 17.6 are the election of the mayor and of the vice mayor. Uh, as we currently have no mayor sitting at the dais, uh, I'll be running the first of those and then turning it over to the newly elected mayor. Uh, 
Ms. Gallagher, do we take public, uh, public comment on both of these items right now? It, yes, you may, you may take them either separately or together is your choice. Okay, I will take them separately, give folks a chance to weigh in. Uh, so we'll start with item 17.5, the election of the new mayor, uh, public comment, and just to make sure that we go over the process so that everybody understands, uh, after public comment, council members will have an opportunity to make a motion and a second. If a council member accepts that nomination, their name will be put in. If there are more than one who are nominated, seconded, and accept, then it will be a vote from the council. Uh, if there are more than two, and whoever gets four votes wins. If there are more than two, and a council member fails to get four votes, the council member who has the fewest votes will no longer be in the running. It'll be uh, a revote of the council. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. With that, I will take public comment on items on item 17.5, the election of the mayor. Ms. Gomez, do we have any cards? Oh, I apologize, I've got two right in front of me. Dana Bellwether, followed by Naji Rain Asuji Bearskinner, and I apologize if I butchered that. Hello, I'm Dana Bellwether. I live in Santa Rosa, and I um, urge the council to elect Julie Combs mayor. I've been watching uh, city council meetings pretty regularly for about five years, and Julie is the council member who, for all that time, has consistently spoken and voted on behalf of the majority of the people of Santa Rosa and not just uh, whoever donates the most to the campaign fund. Um, she is uh, rational, she has common sense, she uh, analyzes research well, and uh, she's uh, the kind of person who can uh, do a good job in a leadership role. Um, so I, I very strongly urge you to elect her mayor, and here's a thought, maybe from now on, the public could elect the mayor. Thank you, good night. Thank you, Ms. Bellwether. Najee Bearskinner. Na Najee. Gregory Fearon, and he'll be followed by Thomas Ells. Good evening, we've talked a lot about Santa Rosa changing, so I'd like to take this opportunity to make a recommendation to all of you that you um, get the charter group organized early and address the main issue which causes us to have to go into angst every time we're asking each of you to run for mayor or to be mayor or get yourself selected because the job is so hard for all of you that hardly uh, do you have time to be council people, much less mayor. Um, we advocate that you all get yourselves salaries. We advocate that you get yourself some assistance and we advocate that you elect, uh, that you allow us to elect a direct mayor. Uh, we think that's probably the next step for Santa Rosa and uh, we're advocating at this point that, uh, and recognizing how hard it is for you to select even among yourselves, someone who has the time and the energy and who can put the job, uh, the energy into the job that it requires. Thank you, Mr. Fearon. Thomas Ells. Well, thank you very much and congratulations to the new council and, and to the, the most recent mayor. And thank you for your efforts in the most recent uh, unpleasantness as they called the Civil War. Um, I think each council member mentioned that there was new and added leadership that the mayor brought, and that's gonna have to redouble. I think you saw the graphics, the, the dashboard of how much was expended so far and how much you need still to recoup and to spend on all that you're gonna do. So you had leadership as a, a cheerleader, um, 
and 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 as a, a support, um, a statesman, you're going to need some bookkeeping. You're going to need follow up. You're going to need to track all of these things. There, it's that and more because the homelessness. There's 22,000 homeless people according to the survey. 11,000 from before the fire and another 11,000 after the fire. Potential. Uh, homeless, according to the count, uh, not currently homeless, according to the count, but homeless. They're already homeless. Um, we need to redouble. Imagine, imagine the effort from before the fire until after the fire. And you're going to have to redouble that again. That's the mayor you need, the one who can do that and come to the table and solve the problems. Because we do have issues, there's, there's issues. Um, and, and there are some yet to come. And, and I wanna leave this on a very hopeful note. Um, we will see in, an, in the very, very near future, and I hope that I'm wrong, uh, but there are things at work right now, and I don't wanna talk about sounding, lightning bolts or anything like that. Um, but the, the cake's baked as far as interest rates and things like that, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, and I, I want to be really hopeful and, and that we can secure the funding that's coming and use those uh, with local contracting and local building and, and so that we don't have all these funds go evaporate out of our community. I want to congratulate you again and thank you and look forward to working with the council. Thank you, Mr. Ells. That's the last card that I had. I'm gonna bring it back to the council uh, and I'm gonna go, I apologize, I didn't see a card for you, go ahead. I'm Victoria Yanez with Homeless Action exclamation point. And I'm tired of everybody saying homeless action and leaving out the exclamation point. Anyway, um, I was very impressed with the oath of office that was taken today, tonight, um, and the emphasis on the Constitution. And it seems a shame that since the homeless emergency was declared, how much money has been spent on the criminalization of homelessness, which is basically violation of the rights of the homeless. So Ms. Giannis, this is the election of the new mayor? Yes, and I'm make... talking about the oath of office that yeah. was taken. And I was even following around Officer Wolf one time and asking him, shouldn't he be doing a mutiny on the bounty, on the county? the last time, but before it was the city, <sighs> knowing that they were just doing the turf, moving people from place to place, <sighs> he should have refused to do it because the officers also take that oath. So I'm just saying, you know, why do we have to wait for everything to go to federal court to be interpreted? Because let me tell you, I was very disappointed when I found out that Mr. Schwendhelm was the chair of the Leadership Council on how to spend the 12 million for the homeless. I thought that he was one of the chief um, designers of the program to criminalize the homeless. So this didn't seem too hopeful for me. I figured, you know, Catholic charities will get a new roof and whatever else they want, and the homeless are still gonna be on the street. So yes, you know, I am talking about homeless, but I'm talking about it in relation to the oath that was taken tonight. I want everybody to take that oath to heart, because we're talking about enemies foreign and domestic. And I think that we need to look out for ourselves to make sure that we ourselves are not an enemy of the Constitution. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yanos. So I'm gonna bring it back and I'm gonna open it up for nominations for the mayor for a two-year term. Uh, Council Member Tibbetts. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, I'd like to nominate Tom Schwedhelm for mayor. Second. 
Are there any other nominations? Uh, Council Member Swethelm, do you accept the nomination? Are there any other nominations for the position of mayor? Seeing none, I will uh, declare Tom the winner by acclamation, by unanimous consent. Come take your seat. Thank you, Vice Mayor Rogers. We'll now move to item 17.6, the election of the Vice Mayor. Do we have any cards on this item? No cards. I will then open it up to the body. Vice Mayor Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'd like to nominate Council Member Fleming. Is there a second? I'll second. We have a second. I do, <clears throat> I do not. So Council Member Fleming declines the nomination. Do we have any other nominations? Council Member Sawyer? I would like to nominate um, current Vice Mayor uh, Chris Rogers to serve another term. Second. We have a nomination and a second. Uh, Mr. Rogers, would you accept that? He accept that? Do we have any other nominations for Vice Mayor? I would like to put out another nomination, and that's Julie Combs. Julie Combs has been nominated. Is there a second on that nomination? I second. And Councilmember Combs, do you accept that nomination? Yes, I do. Okay. Are there any other nominations? Seeing none. Um, City Clerk Gomez, how would we do this? Is this by roll call vo vote? That is correct. I'm going to pass out a ballot um, so that everyone has everyone's name listed, and then you can just um, select between. Since there were two nominations, you're only going to vote for one nominee. Um, and let me pass out that ballot. Great. Thank you. So each council member will cast one vote by roll call in order of last name, and the nominee receiving four more votes, the majority will be mayor, uh, vice mayor, excuse me. Council member Combs. I vote for Combs. Council member Fleming. Council member Combs. Council member Oliveras. Rogers. Council Member Rogers. Rogers. Council Member Sawyer. Rogers. Mayor Schwedhelm. Rogers. Council Member Tibbetts. Combs. Vice Mayor Rogers has the majority. Congratulations, Vice Mayor Rogers. It's traditional to ask for that vote to be done again as a unanimous motion, and I would like to make that motion that we make it unanimous. Second. We have a motion for another vote by Council Member Combs, a seconded by Sawyers. All in favor? Mr. Sawyer? It's not. <laughs> I'm hitting it. <laughs> Shall we give it another try? That's what I Council Member Tippetts. John. They're at a they're at a sink. There we go. And we have a unanimous work. Thank you, Councilmember Combs, for bringing that up. Congratulations. 
Any additional cards for the final public comment period? Great. Uh, no other announcements um, on item 20, which will be the adjournment of the meeting. Meeting is adjourned. Uh, apparently, we, we do have a couple of comments. Non agenda items. So, first, we'll start with Merlin. Ready to roll there, Martin? Having technical difficulties. You want to have the other one go and you come oh, right after? Go. Inaction and Homelessness is Sonoma Shame by Kathleen Finnegan on December 9, 2018. Sonoma County's homeless people have been dealt a double whammy in the past few weeks by dangerously smoky air and the sudden drop of nighttime temperatures to near freezing. Every night, some 2,000 individuals are sleeping on our streets, says Sheriff-elect Mark Essick. It's more than sad that fervent pleas in the past several months by homeless action and other advocates to act quickly to protect people from the winter cold and rains have fallen on deaf ears at the city and, and county. Concurrently, a series of official findings have shown without a doubt that the city and county's homeless policies are not only inadequate, but contributing to the worsening situation. The most recent of these came at the Santa Rosa City Council's November 13th meeting when Bob Aronson, the independent police auditor, gave his second annual report. Aronson gave the police department good grades on most critical issues, but spoke candidly about the failure of the city's homeless policy to alleviate the situation. With respect to the city's, city's relentless sweeps of encampments comprising people who have no legal place to go, Aronson said that officers have a hard time knowing that they are only turfing the problem, pushing it around from one location to another, and that in the process of doing so, that they may be creating additional suffering in the homeless community. This work, in addition to changing nothing for the disadvantaged, has only damaged officer morale. In addition, the question of violations of international human rights standards for those experiencing homelessness has been raised by three important bodies. On October 20th, the Sonoma County Commission on Human Rights announced that it had passed a resolution based on Article 25 of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as well as the UN's International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, declaring that local governments have been carrying out aggressive action in eliminating unsanctioned encampments without providing short or long-term housing options for all residents without shelter and thus falling short of their obligation to honor the human rights of all residents. Such actions effectively criminalize homelessness, said Human Rights Co Commission Chairman Kevin Jones, adding that such criminalization contravenes the UN Committee of the El Elimination of Racial Discrimination and constitutes cruel, in inhumane, and degrading treatment in violation of UN Article 9. I encourage you all to read the rest. Thank you, uh, Michael Titoni, followed by Victoria Yanez. Is Michael still here? Thank you. Hello. Um, so we have new faces on the council, which is great, and I think this is a good time for us to maybe make some steps forward. Um, and I, I think um, I really want to second Adrian Lobby's um, idea that we have other options for winter shelters. I think um, there's a lot of people still out on the street right now, um, and it, it just makes the situation a lot worse when you know you don't not only don't have uh, 
a shelter. You don't not only have a, a place to go, but you, you're constantly being forced to be relocated. Um, the spirit of Housing First is to create stability for your, your population, for the, the population in this city who does not have a home, so that they can help themselves. And it becomes much, much harder to do that when people not, when there's a 1,500 person wait list at Sam Jones, and when there's only two days of the week that you can go there and sign up. Um, I, I just think, you know, this is, this is really, this is, a, this is a good idea, and we should take advantage of it. That's all I wanna say, thank you. Thank you. Victoria Yanez? Yes, um, I just think that um, the best thing that the new city council could do would be to start with a cease and desist order to the police department to not take away life-sustaining property from the homeless. And um, I'm gonna continue on with the article. The Sonoma County chapter of the American Civil Liberties Unit co Union confirmed such violations, which were originally presented in a detailed report to the Human Rights Commission by Homeless Action, exclamation point, on June 26. The ACLU supported the resolution and called for an immediate amnesty from arrest for people camping in public spaces and creation with all due haste of safe haven villages of tiny homes with security, hygiene, and sanitation facilities, trash collection, case management, and wraparound services as the logical continuum of the housing first model embraced by the county and the city. In September, UN Special Reporter Leilani Farha decried homeless conditions in the Bay Area, denying access to water, sanitation, and health services and other basic necessities constitute cruel and unhuman treatment and is a violation of multiple human rights, including the rights to life, housing, health, and water and sanitation, Farha wrote. Such punitive policies must be prohibited in law and immediately ceased, she added. In Santa Rosa, Homeless Action Exclamation Point has provided portable toilets to encampments on numerous occasions only to find that they were removed by authorities within 24 hours. People of good conscience, it is is it not time for you to stand up and reassert boldly what Sonoma Strong really means? For without your support, there's good reason to fear that the crisis here is quickly sliding into Sonoma's shame. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Having no other additional cards or other items, meeting adjourned.